Hello, Mish. Hi, Kathleen. How are you doing? Okay, okay. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for giving this talk. I'm so excited. I wanted to do this for a long time. Ah, I'm looking forward to discussion and learning. <laughs> well, I'm the one who's going to learn. Uh, very much mute. Now, I have a mystery slide. I was just showing um, one thing with a, a colleague, Jarrett Rushmore. I don't know if you if you know him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, have you ever seen anything like this? And um, he said, oh, well, I think it's this and that. I said, well, I don't think it's this and that. And he said, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to be the this and that slide. <laughs> okay, you get my curiosity. I want to see. Well, you may know and say, well, sure, didn't didn't you know this since kindergarten? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I'm still learning a lot. I was uh, I was speaking with a colleague and he was showing me something in neuroanatomy in the corpus callosum that I never seen before. I'll send you some images. Yeah, very surprising. Very surprising. Yeah, very yeah. No. I'm uh, I'm telling myself and more and more people this is this is the uh, quote unquote the new me. The last chapter was single axons, and now we're a little bit getting into. Uh, not to practice tractography, but tracks, let's say. <laughs> I know, I was surprised. I slide through your your slideshow and, uh, and I saw this tractography and I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't. Just uh, you have to consider me a newbie in this <laughs> and work in, okay. work in progress. But We have very high resolution post-mortem tractography if you're interested to have a look. I will. Uh, I certainly will be. Uh, yeah. We're happy to make it available. Yeah, and I'm very glad to see um, at least yourself and and Stephanie coming to uh, Corsica in uh, March. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. I see you um, before, uh, though. I I doubt it somehow. Yeah, there's going to be a big debate because um, the way computational neuroscientists and neuroanatomists envision the connection in the brain and how they should be reconstructed is not the same. And uh, that's why we need to talk. Yeah. All right, Marcela, Annie. So the impact factor of brain structure and function came out today. Uh -huh. It's disappointing. We've been working so hard. And then we had 3.1. And then like, oh my God, I was <laughs> very disappointed all afternoon. And then I checked all of the journals in neuroimaging and neuroanatomy and everybody took a hit. Uh -huh, uh -huh, mostly, uh -huh. um, this is mostly because they changed the way they calculate the impact factor. Oh, I see. Now it's like the publication online and not anymore the printing or official date of publication of the papers. So papers uh, typically have less time to get cited and known. Right. I see, I see. Um, yeah, a bit disappointing, but yeah. You know. Well, I know um, Laszlo Zaborski is, is really um, very, very uh, preoccupied, I guess, uh, not so much with the journals, but with the state of neuroanatomy, the perception of neuroanatomy. And, uh, uh, I think he's he's right. I just don't know what the best uh, course is, but maybe we'd be in touch with with you. He'd he'd like to write, I guess, like a. Um, I don't. I'm not sure. He's uh, it's something like a manifesto, I, I suppose. I think yeah, it's important to do it. Um, uh, anatomy is getting out of fashion at the moment, um, mm -hmm. but. I don't know. I strongly believe what Kazilas used to say it was like, it can come in out of fashion. You have new fashion and new thing coming and going, but anatomy will still be there yeah. for the next 200, 300 years, but maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's from his long career. So <laughs> I guess, you know, we should be okay. It's just a, a little moment where artificial intelligence and computational neuroscience are taking over. 
yeah that that's that's what that's what uh, i that's what i thought well i think uh i i told laszlo that to the small extent we've discussed that the timing may not quite be right for anything like manifesto go just a few weeks or few months uh for ai to uh form itself a bit more maybe have some failures mm -hmm. even let's say <laughs> and then uh, step in i i it's it is important it it let's see mm. or we should try to find a way to use ai for neuroanatomy which is not a bad idea yeah yeah, yeah. no i i i i agree at least some touch points no mm -hmm. uh, So I don't know if, if uh, this may not be the, the time or place to go back to your earlier comments on uh, uh, different opinions on how to uh, reconstruct the uh, connectivity. Oh, oh uh, I have no, I have no sec secret. Like you know, we can we can come back to it if you want. Yeah, happy to happy to chat about this. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I've seen I've seen different many different papers submitted and many different fashion of yeah. way to build the connection in the brain and um, I don't know those are mathematical reconstructions uh -huh. um, so we've been very careful with Stephanie always to have an algorithm that fit Klingler, Klinger postmodern dissections, which is not the best and we I agree it is not the best and we cannot yeah. see everything but at least <laughs> what we see we yeah. know we it with a different method yeah those publications are quite beautiful mm -hmm. really uh are quite quite stunning and then we try to go a little further um using the um the atlas of Spaman and pandya because ah, yeah. you have several cases that are put next to each other with different injections and you can you can start actually exploring whether short fibers that you see in humans could match something that you see in monkeys. Mm -hmm. it's a lot difficult well, that's, that's why I, uh, let me see. Uh, I am not concentrating on that as yet, but I'm in and around the issue. Mm -hmm. And the uh, material I put together today, I think we'll be making a point that some of the sparse uh, subpopulations uh, neurochemically labeled can be very useful as another tool for looking at the uh, organization. A tyrosine, this this monkey, it's monkey, unfortunately, but um, a very high quality database. And I found it extremely useful for uh, uh, spotlighted uh, a question. So the tyrosine hydroxylase, I'm talking about white matter, but mm -hmm. you'll see right away with the images you get, um, it can be a tool for investigating uh, superficial white matter. If it were in human or even in an animal in serial sections, then you can, you can, um, or in block, you can fall in, in volume. Right now, the, the posted database is um, sections one millimeter apart. And that's helpful, but not probably not adequate for everything. I'll see what you mean. I'll see what you mean. Um, I think I have to introduce you before we start with your talk. <laughs> and it's now seven past the time of the start. So I should probably get going. Yeah. I, prepared, I prepared something. Um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you our uh, um, esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Kathleen Rockland. With an illustrious career spanning from several decades and a profound impact in the field of neuroscience, Dr. Rockland is a renowned expert in neuroanatomy and neurobiology and a true inspiration in her field. Dr. Rockland journey began with her doctoral studies at the prestigious Schaubonian and Advisian School of Medicine in 1979. 
Under the guidance of Dr. Deepak Pandya, she delved into the connection, into the intricate working of feed forward and feedback cortical connections, paving the way for groundbreaking, groundbreaking research in the field. Continuing her pursuit of knowledge, Dr. Rockland embarked on a postdoctoral study at the Medical University of South, Car South Carolina, collaborating with Jennifer Loon to investigate patchy horizontal interesting collaterals. These studies further expanded her understanding of cortical connectivity in no human primates. In 1983, Dr. Rockland established her own independent laboratory, laboratory at the E.K. Shriver Center in Valtam. I'm sorry for my French accent. Where, <laughs> where she continued her pioneering work on cortical connectivity. In 1988, Dr. Rockland joined the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology at the Boston University School of Medicine as an assistant professor, further enhancing her academic prowess. Recognizing her exceptional ability and expertise, she was later invited to join the esteemed Department of Neurology at the University of Iowa in 1999. During her time at the University of Iowa, Dr. Rockland embarked on a significant collaboration with Kenji Tanaka in the Brain Science Institute at Riken in Wako, Japan. And this collaboration ultimately led to an invitation to join brain, the Brain Science Institute as lab head in the year 2000. At the Brain Science Institute, she established a renowned lab for cortical organization and systematics, solidifying her reputation as a visionary leader in the field. In 2012, Dr. Rockland returned to the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology at Boston University, where she initiated a new laboratory dedicated to exploring the microstructure of the human postmortem cortex. A multidisciplinary approach and commitment to bridging the gap between animal models and human research have earned a widespread recognition and admiration within the scientific community. Therefore, today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Kathleen Rockland, a research professor at Boston University in anatomy and neurobiology, uh, uh, giving us a talk um, about uh, the uh, recent work where she did on the histological example of white matter support organization in non-human primate. Thank you. Amish, th thank you so much for a beautiful summing up and, and, and introduction. <clears throat> so I'm very happy to have this opportunity to uh, talk to you and, and interact. Uh, please feel free. I don't know what your usual format is, but feel free to interrupt. And uh, especially me, if if you feel I, I need to explain something, please pull me back. That would be the easiest way. Okay, so what I primarily want to do today is uh, the broader scope is talk about two things. One is the existence of, of mixed tracks. Um, the emphasis being that the most homogeneous or unified track is mixed. So the example here might be the optic radiations from the thalamus to the uh, cortex. And the mixture there would be different, um, different axon diameters and notably neurochemical uh, populations, calbindin positive and parvalbumin positive uh, excitatory fibers. Um, the examples that I'll be using are of sparse populations in the corpus callosum, anterior commissure, stria terminalis, and a few other comments, uh, with finalizing with um, remarks on white matter neurons and, and possible structure there. The uh, a second point I want to make, which is really uh, the, the old expression was calls to Newcastle, uh, bringing back um, comments to the uh, to really experts, but the importance of postmortem human neuroanatomy, uh, a lot of it, there is a lot now at a macro level, but still less at a high resolution. And um, that is important in terms of further organization of the of the uh, cortex. There's a lot already. When I say cortex now, I'm I should be saying white matter. Uh, and if I spent several decades in the gray matter, so please forgive me if uh, I uh, flip into 
cortex and think think white matter. There is a lot of, of data on topo topographic organization. So this is from a recent paper of, um, of Suzanne Haber, among others. Uh, and the a point there will be making injections of tracer in different areas and then mapping the organization uh, within the fight white matter tracks. So this has been done for internal capsule, uh, corpus callosum. But the actual fiber orientation, we know, I think, that there is a difference in the orientation, but the details, I think, are still uh, forthcoming. Okay, so those are the two points. Um, that the tracks are mixed, the orientation is complex, it's a, both a problem and a challenge, and that we can do a lot in human... Um, okay, now why can I not advance? Oh, there we go, the advance in uh, post-mortem material. Uh, but nodding to the what I spent uh, several decades working on, uh, I just have this single slide on single axon reconstruction. So this is uh, in the monkey. And the method of choice, or at least a common method of looking at the connectivity is to make uh, a tracer injection in a source area. Here I use the example of CA1 hippocampus. And uh, then look at the targets, scan the brain, or look at known targets for further detail. Uh, so here is the source, CA1. Here is projection to frontal cortex, which was known from bulk injections. Single axon work, you can see much more detail in terms of what is the uh, divergence in the gray matter and what is the laminar uh, profile. So here, um, it's a little bit unusual compared to sensory areas, but you can see there are terminations along the um, ascending axon, primarily in layer one, two, and then also in layer four. Um, I'm going to pass on further detail here, but this is, this is what you can achieve in single axons. There's a big gap, however, and that is, wouldn't it be nice to have the complete trajectory from the source area to frontal cortex? That's uh, partly feasible if you use interest uh, within single neuron uh, injections. And that's been done a fair amount um, in the uh, cortical basal ganglia uh, system, Martin um, Parent, uh, among others. Uh, in general, however, it is quite difficult, a low sample size, and if you use extracellular injections, the, um, the necessity of having strict serial sections from your source straight through to the target is almost an impossibility. And if that's not an impossibility, you're going to have all sorts of problems of a crowded, and, and so it, it is still not, uh, not done. Uh, why would you want, okay, just very quickly, uh, in the human material, there uh, are studies now of combining, this is from, uh, there are several groups, uh, and this was, I just took this from one recent paper. Uh, you can take a, a block of uh, postmortem tissue, and a, a very interesting approach is to combine here uh, polarized light imaging of I think it was three, well, slabs of tissue, not as thick as shown here, and then subsequent postmortem, uh, I'm sorry, diffusion MRI, and then subsequent postmortem, either PLI, polarized light imaging, and I think people know what that is, or uh, histology. The point being to try to, let's say, uh, back engineer to interpret what you are seeing in the, the um, imaging. How accurate is it in terms of uh, the perennial problem of crossing or intermingling of the uh, orient orientations? Now, why would you want further detail? And we can discuss this, but the, the uh, obvious points are, well, as a guide for intervention, surgical intervention, in uh, electrical stimulation, et cetera. And then in terms of basic science as an assays for variability, in terms of individual variability, lifespan variability, 
uh, left-right hemisphere variability, comparative species data, and uh, last but not least, practical uh, brain, what I just showed, brain imaging uh, interpretation. So how accurate uh, are you really seeing what you think you're seeing and how better can you develop it? And as I said, what I'm uh, going to be sharing with you today is the results of postmortem histology uh, taken from monkey, macaque monkey, but uh, in principle applicable to the human brain. The technique is um, antibodies against um, native antigens like calcium binding proteins, parvalbumin. Uh, you could also non-glutamatergic, and this is the emphasis this morning to, or today, non-glutamatergic uh, sparse uh, connect, uh, connections, tyrosine hydroxylase, um, noradrenergic or dopaminergic, uh, serotonergic, and cholinergic. And there were others that one, one could use. The problem here, I said in principle, the problem is in getting good quality material. Uh, with short post uh, postmortem uh, intervals, uh, properly fixed, which is uh, has been four percent paraformaldehyde, not ten percent formalin, and then uh, antibodies. You can use, of course, uh, try um, antibody retrieval, but uh, the more manipulations you do, the more difficult it becomes. Okay, so. We will, we're going to be here for most of the remainder of the talk. I said uh, several areas. Uh, so the, the uh, first I'm going to talk about the, give you examples from the corpus callosum, mainly the anterior portion. Then we're going to move to the uh, anterior commissure. And then time allowing, and I think there will be, the uh, stria terminalis. And uh, finally, ending up with comments on uh, white matter neurons. The This is human brain, of course, and this is monkey brain. Um, as I just said, I, in principle, I'll repeat, most of what I'm saying uh, is applicable in terms of technique to the human brain, but we are going to be looking at monkey material. This is based on a very nice uh, open access database on the coronal sections of monkeys, monkey brains at different ages. Um, some of them are, most of them are complete, a series of 10 different stains. And uh, you can access uh, yourself, um, probably not during the talk, but after the talk and confirm and extend uh, what we will be saying. Let's see. To begin, however, I'm going to go back to uh, single axon reconstruction. So these are, this is the beginning now of the section on corpus callosum. Um, I'm showing you two brains with anterior grade tracer, a BDA tracer in uh, parietal areas. And therefore, we're looking at a parietal, uh, parietal fibers originating one hemisphere going to the other. And they they look as they look to conform to the dominant, what would I think would be considered the dominant medial lateral organization of the corpus callosum. Giorgio Innocenti, in collaboration with um, Caminiti, among others, has done a lot of work on this, primarily with the topography and axon diameter. Now, the point I'm making here is it looks medial lateral, but we should not be fooled into thinking of this as a box of spaghetti. Okay, so uh, medial lateral is, is it really parallel fibers? Approximately, yes. But as we showed here, we took uh, groups of uh, five groups of about five fibers starting at the midline of the corpus callosum, color coded these segments, and then followed them in sequential section as far as seemed feasible at the time. And you can see the, um, the uh, volumes here, it's, it's approximately five millimeters uh, medial lateral. When you do that, look at the color code. What is, is um, the sequence medial is not the same as lateral. In other words, they, they um, are not strict parallel through at least through this extent. 
they shift position, and they even seem to uh, braid or twist together. Uh, the work with this at this uh, this approach is is very labor intensive, so it's a small sample size. I can't tell you well what uh, does it become more parallel at the midline and then twist again, um, but at least it is something to keep in mind that. The axon, they, they start in a topographic order. They probably finish in a topographic order at the um, a target area. But in between, uh, they, they can lose their step, lose order. And that type of thing, the mixing in between the trajectory, has, I believe, been shown by uh, in the even in the optic track. Starts topographic, ends topographic, but somehow and almost hard to believe by the um, the investigator, uh, they mix in between. The, uh, okay, injections are obviously uh, impractical, certainly for humans, and even difficult in monkey. So uh, now I'm going to turn to the native antigens, and here we're looking at uh, a single section that I, I present of parvalbumin. Parvalbumin, of course, is, is linked to uh, inhibitory interneurons, but in the primate, not the rodent, but in the primate, monkey and human, uh, parvalbumin and calbindin are also used by the thalamocortical uh, terminations and by a subset of cortical cortical, especially the uh, motor, uh, motor areas and uh, probably parietal. So I don't know the source of these. This is the um, midline, of course. And the uh, I don't know the actual source, but I'm guessing uh, is, these would be motor areas. And the parvalbumin is showing a consistent with a single shot of the uh, BDA, what looks like a predominant um, medial lateral orientation. We can accept for now that it is. But if you look at another strata, uh, especially skirting the dorsal part of the corpus callosum, you have the impression, and that's all I can share with you right now, is the impression that it's a slightly different trajectory, much more uh, anterior, posterior. So in coronal section, if the, uh, if the axons are traveling AP, you're going to get uh, shorter segments, not long, but shorter like that. Okay, so this would be one way uh, of looking at um, the trajectories uh, with some limitations. I mean, you don't know the exact uh, origins, but you can extrapolate to some extent. Okay, now the I'm not going to uh, say how I got into the tyrosine hydroxylase. I think I was... I'm, not sure I even remember at this point, <laughs> but I was, and I don't think I was just uh, doing a travel log through the corpus callosum. But anyhow, this is our observation. If you look at um, this is coronal section, of course, the frontal section of the um, of the uh, rhesus monkey, and the uh, higher magnification is here. You might expect uh, a predominant medial lateral orientation in conjunction with the glutamatergic uh, fibers. Uh, but in point of fact, there are uh, there is they're scattered but not rare medial uh, dorsal ventral oriented fibers, which seem to be um, I I'll give you a few more e examples, uh, seem to be coursing, uh, between the septum and the overlying indusium grisium. You don't see that here, but we'll see it in a minute. Um, some of them are a predominantly dorsal ventral, and some are skirting uh, a little bit uh, lateral toward the cingulum bundle. Now, it's been reported that the cingulum bundle contains uh, monoaminergic fibers, but the trajectory uh, apparently, at least some of them are poking up uh, actually through the corpus callosum to uh, penetrating that to go to the uh, cingulum bundle. So uh, one component and a second component. In addition, uh, 
we're going to see in, in several of these slides, these rather, to me, unexpected uh, little bundles. They even look more like tubes when we continue. But yes, they're medial lateral. Isn't that, isn't that nice? But if you look closer, you can see that these uh, medial lateral things are made up of uh, tightly packed bundles of, of, of fibers that are obliquely cut, therefore, in the coronal plane, going anterior, posterior. So let's look at that uh, another slide. The, you'll see I've given you the, um, you can certainly send me email and I can share these data with you. Uh, these are ongoing studies. We have an EBRO abstract in September, I guess, which um, my colleague El El Elvaro Duque will be presenting. And I, I sent a copy to, uh, to Mish. Uh, this is tyrosine hydroxylase, the same brain. Uh, it's 2.5 months old. Um, section 20. Okay. Um, each, if, if it were section 21, it would be one millimeter uh, removed. So here again, we're in the midline. You can see a little bit better now the cingulate uh, bundle. Maybe you can see, um, but you can also visit the website. Uh, fibers going toward this direction. And uh, the persistence of these little uh, mini, mini fascicles. Now, I don't know if I'm uh, overemphasizing the midline. Uh, if you look, it, it's pretty obvious that there's a concentration, especially the previous uh, slide, the concentration at the, at the midline, probably not with enough resolution to be picked up in imaging, uh, I would assume. But even so, there's at least um, one paper reporting, uh, this was a validation paper of, of, of um, imaging uh, PLI, polarized light imaging, uh, myelin and astrocytes. And they were reporting um, different, this is, I'm not doing the diffusion myself, so I get a little bit of, uh, I don't, I should not be mentioning it because I can't really interpret, but different uh, dispersion factors at the uh, at the midline. So maybe a correlation, uh, maybe not. It could be related to these fibers, could be related to other tissue property at the at the midline. The uh, the this this uh, subpopulation of dorsal ventral to the uh, indusium grisium and to the cingulum bundle is consistent over the brains that we have looked at. And it's not age age dependent. Uh, so this is an, an adult monkey. Um, there are two brains, I think, uh, in the collection, maybe three, uh, eight years old, uh, 10 years old. The indusium grisium, I should mention uh, and remind you, is considered part of um, a left leftover part of the uh, hippocampus and has some partial uh, characteristics uh, of it. So you'll notice I said, well, these are fibers between the septum and the indusium grisium. And I don't know, uh, I'm assuming it's from septum to indusium grisium, not vice versa, or it could be even another population going, going through. Uh, there is a, there are reports that some the nucleus basalis of minor, um, which is source, we'll see in a minute, of cholinergic fibers, also contains some uh, tyrosine hydroxylase positive neurons. So it could be that these are originating not from the uh, brainstem, but actually from nucleus uh, basalis. Uh, as I just said, uh, the most of our observations were based on the tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, the, on qualitative basis, it looks like that is the densest population, especially in the anterior, not the anterior most corpus callosum, but the anterior corpus callosum. However, a broadly similar uh, configuration occurs in a serotonin. So you you can see there's some sparse dorsal ventral fibers, and these would be going uh, either to the indusium grisium or 
to the cingulum bundle. Um, and then the strange um, st mini fascicle like uh, pattern going from uh, medial to lateral, possibly over the corpus callosum. Unfortunately, we just have um, one hemisphere here. Uh, but in closer inspection, they consist of, of uh, AP uh, fibers, not ML. Why they group together in an ML con configuration is, is I don't know, and I so far haven't seen uh, information. So this is just to give, uh, to compare uh, very quickly with the next order of resolution, which would be a polarized light imaging, PLI, uh, now done by, by multiple groups. Uh, this is from, uh, from, uh, from ULIC. And as you know, uh, the orientation is color coded, uh, so you can can see uh, modeling. It's not just completely uniform. There is there are changes, especially in in this image. And uh, I'm quoting the paper here. This group a considerable amount of heterogeneity, a uh, loss of coherence uh, at the at the midline, either because of the fibers are doing something there. Uh, perhaps left over from development. As you know, the, the many complex uh, developmental effects happening uh, at the midline when the corpus callosum is, is, is established. That's, uh, this is uh, one disadvantage here, aside from the resolution is becoming very, very good for PLI, which I, I think many of you might know better than myself. Uh, however, uh, it is limited to myelinated fibers. So um, my understanding has always been that the monoaminergic fibers are not myelinated, and therefore we're seeing something else uh, at that level. Uh, I said we're going to look at several structures. So the second is the anterior commissure. Uh, and here, this is the uh, posterior, uh, we're focusing on the mustache part of the anterior commissure, the posterior. And here the uh, predominant feature, you can see maybe not in the slides I've selected, but if you go to the website, you'll see there are some scattered orient uh, fibers of scattered orientation. But here what really pops out is these uh, medial lateral oriented uh, mini fascicles or mini stria or uh, maybe in this case tubes because they're so they're so close together. Uh, however, if you look, this is tyrosine hydroxylase again. So two sections, one millimeter. Oh, excuse me. This is two different brains, younger and older, about at the same level. The way it's being cut. If you look closely, however, I guess here. Uh, it really looks like you have, again, closely grouped bundle of fibers, in this case, tyrosine hydroxylase positive fibers, and very cut in very small segments. So in coronal section, that would be uh, a, a clue that they are uh, traveling obliquely anterior posterior. There's a, a tyrosine hydroxylase is the densest population, but there is there's all also a, a manifestation with the ser serotonergic and the uh, cholinergic. Now, of course, what you would like to do, and I hope we'll have we'll continue this at least to that extent, is uh, double label fluorescence for uh, tyrosine hydroxylase and the next most abundant, which might be uh, serotonergic here, are, the, are those two populations intermingled in these stripes or do you have a, a complementary, do they overlap in other words, or do you have a complementary pattern? And of course the question might be why? And as I said, uh, I'm, uh, I'm still very much looking for further information on this by ourselves or the uh, literature. There is report, uh, of course, of glia, uh, glia uh, slings at the midline. This is what I was referring to in part. 
uh, talking about the, the setting up of the of the commissures. But I think this is from an old paper in 93. There's continuing uh, work on the establishment of the commissures in the midline. But I think what they're actually talking about as tubes are a little bit macro here as um, the, this would be GFAP positive astroglia tubes. And they're talking about the, and the upper and lower dorsal and ventral uh, portion of what becomes the anterior commissure. Uh, so I don't know what these tube-like structures are. Uh, this is going to a myelin stain, especially at an early age, one day postnatal. And you can already see there is some myelination. Look at the overlying cortex. Um, it's early days for myelination, but the white matter is there. Uh, at this age, the corpus callosum, uh, at least in this case, and as I, I'm going to stress, this is ongoing work for us, uh, is not showing the tubular structure on the basis of myelination. Um, maybe a different plane of section would be necessary or a different label. So I'm not saying it isn't there, but in this section, it is not. Uh, the anterior commissure seems to be at an earlier stage of development where it's only partially myelinated, but we can see these strange uh, aggregated, uh, uh, I think strange aggregations of, of uh, fibers. In this case, I don't think that they're monoaminergic because they are myelinated by definition. So uh, substructure in terms of single fibers and also uh, bundles of, of fibers. Now, bundles of fibers have, uh, of, of course, been uh, identified uh, in other, um, uh, over the years even. This is 1998 from the Mesolon group. And here they have done exactly what I've been uh, sharing with you, using uh, antibodies against, uh, against uh, acetylcholine. This is CHAT. To delineate, this is in human. The what they what's called the uh, lateral and the medial, okay, lateral and medial uh, cholinergic uh, tracts, uh, originating uh, largely or exclusively from nucleus basalis in in the brainstem. Uh, the lateral tract going to uh, various cortical areas, as they're showing here travels uh, largely in the external um, the external capsule, uh, but it does join uh, eventually at certain anterior with the medial track. Medial track is, is clearly shown here. Um, it's uh, largely, if not preferentially, targeted to the cingulum bundle. Uh, the, the trajectory, uh, has been emphasized as going anterior to the rostrum of the corpus callosum and then coming back. But what I'm suggesting from the monkey material is that at least a portion also goes uh, directly through the corpus callosum, perforating the corpus callosum, okay? Um, this is an earlier paper from the uh, uh, Joel Price group when they injected um, anterior gray tracers in nucleus basalis. And you see in the monkey uh, a very similar pathway of what would be, I think, the lateral and medial uh, tracts, cholinergic tracts. They do comment about scattered fibers in, it must have been on the basis of um, autoradiography in the corpus callosum. So I feel that um, it's it's often very comfortable not to be the only person to see this, and at least I can refer. There are probably other papers as well, um, but this was an early observation. And here I've just gone back to um, at the uh, chat stain of here's the cingulum bundle, and some of these fibers medially would be going anterior and in, but others are actually going right through the corpus callosum. These are the mystery ones. 
And just for, uh, I guess, just for fun, but for demonstration, I had pointed out that little join of the lateral and medial cholinergic uh, track in the, uh, oops, let me see if I can go back. Okay. Um, especially here in a, a, actually a pronounced V, if one is thinking of the superficial white matter, that um, V join is either in the superficial uh, white matter or uh, a strata just below it. And you can see that in the uh, different, uh, different uh, antibody stains here. This is medial cholinergic tract, this is lateral. Uh, and okay, here, uh, medial, the V join, superficial white matter, and a portion of the ventral lateral tract as it skirts along the uh, putamen. Uh, I was surprised in following through on this that the, tyros the tyrosine hydroxylase and uh, uh, serotonin uh, fibers follow an approximately similar trajectory to the extent of, of this rather pronounced, uh, what I'm calling a V-join. So the same question comes in, if we were using uh, either sequential, um, sequential, strict sequential sections to reconstruct, <laughs> he wants to be seen, okay. Uh, we might be able to tell something, but uh, it would be very laborious. Uh, a better procedure would be double, um, double immuno to see what extent are these separate, very thin uh, adjoining, but thin fiber bundles and to what extent do they intermingle? It would not of course be double labeled. Uh, just throwing this in, we're back to uh, Parvel Buman is a single, single slide. <coughs> uh, so this is mainly the uh, optic radiations in the coronal section in the monkey. Uh, you can see, however, uh, an extension. This would not be optic radiation, but rather coming out of the um, independent computer here of um, essential sulcus. And it would be very easy to have a, like a postage stamp, uh, exact sequential sections, and they could be probably 70 microns thick. That would work for, for monkey and with the proper conditions for human as, as well. Or uh, more and more available would be the with clarity uh, in block uh, stains. So those are my my first two topics. Now I want to move on, uh, and as you can see, rather quickly. And this is this is a bit of a travel log. I hope only uh, nice places. Uh, my point is to show that the uh, well to use the same analogy, the white matter as we all know, is not just a, a vast Antarctic or, or Arctic uh, scene of, of, of white, but if you look closely, it has its, its own uh, very intricate um, uh, compartments and organization, which would be relevant for intervention, surgical intervention, but for, for development. And also presumably remember these, these axons are, uh, uh, you have to think of things like volume transmission, uh, they are. They have their potentially their own level of um, functional inter interactions. So here, just to comment, the the fact of of, of um, crossing tracks is 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 quite obviously has been a uh, a problem and a challenge in imaging uh, for uh, a long time now. It has been known, I, I think, since. Um, early days of looking at the white matter tracks. There's a very nice recent paper from uh, the Eulet group of documenting the uh, crossing of the, the sagittal stratum by the tapetum fibers. So going uh, uh, medial to lateral um, through, I was gonna say straight through, but we don't know that it's straight. It could be doing uh, various uh, twisting. And this was also shown by the same paper that I'm, I'm referring to. Um, so within, within and across tract um, organization, I guess I would say, uh, then at going to a slightly global, more global level, 
This is Corpus Callosum again. And there are reports of uh, macro level changes in organization uh, based on orientation. We published this in a, as a side result in a paper on uh, diaphorase positive neurons. And that has been shown uh, over the years, especially in development by the uh, Croatia group um, and also by um, the classical uh, Klinger methods uh, here in postmortem brain. Uh, more recently, uh, imaging techniques are, are able to uh, resolve what looks like little uh, teeth or bricks in the uh, a corpus, corpus callosum. So let me review here. This is uh, acetylcholinesterase. Uh, you have in the rostrum, it's, it's, you have a very distinct impression and qualitative, I have to say, it's an impression of uh, distinct uh, compartments. It's a little bit less obvious in diaphorase, but if you look at the uh, scattered neurons, diaphorase positive or nitric oxide positive, which is what they are, neurons, uh, they tend to elongate at this per at this point. We'll come back to this, and I think you really have to squint to see any any suggestion of compartmentalization. Um, but I think if if you went to to the sections and did serial reconstruction, uh, it would be a little bit more convincing. The Croatia group in development has emphasized this a lot. And in early development, the uh, septa in the corpus callosum uh, are very obvious. And I think here also, especially in, in the imaging. Now, why would you want, as I said, in the Innocenti and his um, collaborators have shown uh, area-specific compartmentalization or uh, topography, but why you would want these compartments? Uh, again, if you put the why question is, what are they doing? Um, and I think the previous slide of in Parve, Parvel Buman, these going more, uh, let's see if it's, this is sagittal section, um, but you can see slightly, as, at least a slightly different congregation of uh, different orientation. These little bricks or teeth or whatever you want to call them, septa, are very obvious in certain sections for the optic radiation. So this is uh, thalamocortical uh, in human uh, and uh, parvel bumen para horizontal section uh, where these, I'm going to call them bricks today, are uh, very, very uh, clear. I was fortunate to have a conversation with Carl Zulis when he was presenting similar data maybe five years ago in PLI. And he said, look, I can see them too. <laughs> but we get, didn't get around to discussing, well, why and what are they? Um, are they perhaps parvalbumin bundles uh, interspersed with calbindin? I somewhat doubt it. It doesn't look like that. So I apologize to give you um, now resor resorting to travel log, but I think you can understand why I would be sharing this with you. These are not homogeneous. Uh, it's, it's not just homogeneous fibers, and it's not just heterogeneous either. They're somehow grouped in what looks like a, a um, I could be uh, a méchant and say a deliberate uh, pattern. Uh, okay, just two more uh Portions here. I'm going to go very quickly over the stria terminalis, but I think it it, it reinforces some of these points. Stria terminalis um, in the monkey uh, is a bidirectional, at least a bidirectional trajectory between the amygdala and bed nucleus. Uh, the it's a C-shaped structure like the caudate, and in fact travels next to the caudate. Uh, tail of caudate is, is here, lateral. Uh, we focused in, in a paper that is published, so I'm going to go rather rather quickly, on the dorsal and ventral component. And the ventral, uh, I guess both of them, we also designated an ROI, ROI 
corresponding, uh, co-corresponding to the lateral geniculate nucleus, just so we could try to uh, standardize and avoid some of the more complicated uh, territories. Okay, the point is, uh, I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about the ventral, and we can uh, pass the same, almost the same comments would pertain to the dorsal astria terminalis. Here is an anterior posterior uh, sec, uh, series in tyrosine hydroxylase. And you can notice two things. One, at the anterior level, the fibers seem to be traveling mainly uh, medial lateral, and that shifts posterior to dorsal ventral. That's not too surprising because it conforms to the C shaped structure from. Uh, at this level, it is medial lateral, and then it is, is turning dorsal ventral here. What for us was more surprising and remains so is the, uh, the intricate configuration. And this was consistent over four young animals, two adults, and one, very, one infant. Uh, you have a belt, uh, a aggregation of fibers uh, medially on the border, you have a belt of fibers. Uh, you have uh, what looks like hollows. Almost you want to make at least two uh, subdivisions, uh, a dorsal and ventral. Let, let me see. I have to, I've lost my, whoops. Okay, I have a, a block on the screen. Uh, you can take me back to that, but I'm going to pass here. Oh, I see what happened. Uh, okay, I don't want to move my uh, little thumbnails here, but the I think on the far right, we must have... Let's see, I don't know how to move the screen. Okay, one of these images was supposed to be complementary of uh, Calbinden and Mylan. Where Calbinden, uh, the this ish this side medial side is Calbinden dense, and tyrosine hydroxylase dense and myelin poor. So even within a rather tight bundle like the uh, no okay, like the uh, stria terminalis, a uh, distinct uh, substructure. The I think I can pass then uh, the maybe two more remarks on this. Looking at, in the paper, we looked at the distribution of fibers and also cells. So here we're back to uh, cells. This is Nguyen, calretinin, calbindin, somatostatin, and these are fibers, tyrosine hydroxylase, uh, serotonin, and NPY. And you have clumps, uh, clumps of stuff, you have uh, bands of stuff, uh, a very, a distinct heterogeneity or compartmentalization within this this little uh, fiber tract. It's related to the uh, different cellular and fiber components, but one can also wonder. And, and some of these are very very sharp. Uh, a, you can see an aggregation, but why would it want to make a, a rather uh, a bullseye? Uh, circle. Uh, so this leads to a question, uh, and I'm just going to share that with you as a question. Uh, there's, there is extracellular matrix and uh, uh, proteoglycans in the white matter, in the gray matter also, so in the, in the cortex. And uh, sometimes they vary dramatically point out uh, global compartments. Here I'm using a monoclonal antibody to something called 8B3, which is con chondroitin sulfate uh, proteoglycan. It uh, is partly corresponding to perineuronal nets. And uh, you can see almost uh, draw a line uh, to the gyral white matter and the, the deep white matter and for that matter, maybe a second line in the superficial white matter. And you probably, if we did a battery of uh, stains, maybe with the coherence, 
my prediction is you would see a, a lot of uh, different compartmentalization. The Croatian group might be the best with this in terms of early human development. A related finding, a related uh, marker is actually the superficial, uh, the, uh, it's not superficial, the uh, white matter neurons that occur in the superficial white matter and in the deep white matter. This is the last section of the talk, and I think it's about five minutes. Do I have the time? Okay, so the last part uh, where I'm raising the issue of white matter neurons, uh, you can see we've had several publications on this. They are phylogenetically conserved. Uh, Paul Manger has picked up on this and reported um, quantitative, uh, has several quantitative papers in um, non-human primate and also in exotic, exotica, uh, his South African uh, animals. Uh, the white matter neurons were observed by, uh, by Cajal. They are abundant in development when it's known that they uh, contribute to axon guidance. Obviously, they're doing other things in the adult. Uh, Pashka Rakish has an extensive uh, literature on this as, as well. Uh, more recently, Javier de Felipe, I think it is 2011, has a very nice paper in human, um, normal human, and then human uh, Alzheimer's. And I'll, I'll quote his paper on that. We know that they are a mixed population. Uh, he suggests about 50% are excitatory. The other uh, inhibitory uh, of different types, the minority population is NOS positive, uh, but uh, significant. And they are densest in the superficial white matter, as you can see here, sometimes very dense in gyrus, uh, but also continue into the uh, deeper uh, white matter. The, the, we did two studies on this with uh, some quantification. The, the density varies a little bit from area to area. We worked in monkey and Javier has published in that 2010 or 2011 paper in, uh, in human. They're also very nice. Uh, functionally, the best work is probably in vitro, uh, in rodent, uh, Hannah Moiner in mouse, and uh, Bro Broberger uh, in, I think it is either rat or mouse. Uh, the Broberger shows that uh, these white matter neurons are responding to bath uh, application of neurotensin. And neurotensin might, uh, among other things, might tell you sleep related. So, um, there are hints of what the function may be, probably multi, um, multifunctional. And the network, uh, we know that some project into the cortex, uh, but the, the network of white matter to white matter neurons um, has, as far as I know, not been uh, examined. Related question is, is, do they segment the white matter to some extent? And I can't say that they do, but if you're good at, at, at recognizing the, the Dalmatian dog camouflage, excuse me, um, and you look at these things, you, you, you get the impression that, golly, they're, they're quasi-circular uh, quasi quasi -circular groupings there. Uh, is it possible that they are um, uh, embracing uh, certain subfascicles? I almost doubt it, but it's it's an obvious question. So we reported that, and if you look at the um, even this slide, I, I refrain from putting in arrows, but I would put an arrow here, an arrow here. Um, now remember, these are cell soma, and the actual neuron does have dendritic extension. So I'm not sure uh, how significant these quasi circles would be once you start factoring in if they are quasi circles. Uh, back to the corpus callosum, I think this is a, a fairly good demonstration, although, uh, okay, of uh, superficial white matter uh, and progressive, progressively less dense as you go deeper. This would be a border of sorts, uh, 
between a singular bundle and other. Uh, and as a dramatic uh, demonstration, we could go to the uh, colossal midline again. This is an adult uh, brain monkey. Uh, here's low magnification and higher magnification. Uh, they're scattered, but they're there. And almost finally, the going back to our monkey diaphorase work, uh, there's been a lot of, of uh, research on diaphorase positive neurons and the neurovascular glia unit in the gray matter, um, Bruno Colley, among others. But I was uh, startled in screening, and I, again, I, this is, uh, I can't give you the history here, but uh, I think we were looking at gray matter, and I happened to drop down uh, visually to the, the corpus callosum and said, well, golly, uh, there are neurons in the, uh, toward the midline even of the corpus callosum. These are the diaphorase positive neurons. And uh, they are to some extent associated with vasculature. Um, so here's the soma. You can see it's reaching out, sometimes very closely uh, vertical, but it's not one-on-one. -on -one. Not every blood vessel has a, uh, a neuron, as far as I can see, and not every neuron has a blood vessel. Uh, so what does this say? Well, the first thought is that some kind of a coupling, selective, I don't know, but a coupling of uh, neural activity, axon activity, and the, uh, and the vasculature. Last comment here is I said that the uh, from the in vitro work <laughs> we know and maybe others that the uh, neuron the white matter neurons do project at least some of them into the gray matter and not only that but some of them project you might expect okay well superficial white matter uh, they must poke up into the gray matter and they do but uh, there also is uh, are projections that are more distant. So this was reported uh, from uh, my work in Japan uh, with a, uh, Tomioka had developed a very nice Golgi-like retrograde tracer. So we would make, uh, it was an adenovirus. We'd make injections in this case in macaque area V4. And uh, somewhat at a distance, this is anterior, uh, there were uh, neurons in the in the white matter. You can see they were outside of the injection site. Well, maybe you can't, but you know, trust me. Um, and here are one, one, two, two at, at a higher magnification and three at, at the lower. So they're not terribly abundant. They, they as far as I know, they don't uh, clump or cluster, but they they do exist. And it goes. Um, actually, this is a second paper from uh, collaborators at Parma, where they were injecting the putamen, uh, looking mainly at, uh, with retrograde tracers, uh, cholera toxin in this case, uh, mainly looking at cortical neurons, cortical uh, putamen, and claustral putamen. But this also showed a scattering of neurons shown in red in the white matter. Uh, and she gives us the uh, extent to which the AP extent, a distance in which these, these neurons occurred. They're, of course, denser in the vicinity of the injection site, but they go uh, several millimeters of uh, AP. So at least some of the white matter neurons, and I assume, I'd like to assume they're excitatory, uh, project into cortical areas, and some also project into uh subcortical areas these i don't know if if um if elena is continuing with this uh they could be a scattered population of excitatory and uh, gabaergic i think she had some idea that it would be uh, gabaergic okay so that was a a quick walk through several components of the white matter Simply to emphasize what, what, frankly, we already know, that there is compartmentalization in, in the white matter. Uh, I do think, however, that we probably have not fully appreciated uh, 
the full organization and of course what it's doing. And I'll come back to those little tubes in the anterior commissure. If anyone knows more, please let us know um, and or come to the uh, Ebro abstract. I won't be there, but um, Elvar uh, Duque, who has organized this website uh, will be. He is very, very willing to share data uh, uh, with people. So I would encourage you to go to the website, go to the poster. Uh, the last slide that I chose is, is from uh, a Monkey again. This was viral injections in Monkey, uh, a group in China. Um, Bob Desimone was a collaborator. Uh, viral injections uh, and then uh, slab-like um, sectioning with clarity and uh, reconstructing groups of individual axons, in this case from medial dorsal thalamus, reunion thalamus, to contralateral cortex. And again, color coded, this is a small group, six, six neurons. Uh, is a, here you have a fascicle, but not a box of spaghetti. It seems like maybe you never have a box of spaghetti, a bowl of cooked spaghetti. <laughs> Okay, um, and they, in their abstract, they talk about the complex turning in, in rooting. So something to keep in mind, although it's a little different than white matter organization, is what I said, uh, starting topographic, ending topographic in a way, but how they get there is is complex, and, and uh, uh, I, I probably need to go back to the data on optic track, where that issue of scrambling um, has been uh, further uh, investigated. I'm thinking of Carol Mason and uh, Linda Richards now at Wash U has talked about it to some extent, among many others, I'm sure. Uh, so what does this? what is the take home message? I just said it at a very general level and I don't wanna venture further that the uh, white matter has organization. Uh, is it different than the, than the gray matter? Uh, how do the two relate? Uh, what we want to think about is different axon populations uh, on the uh, different axon diameters. Uh, probably, I didn't put down disease, but disease process for sure, developmental processes, there is a literature, and to some extent at least limited the mechanism of just staying here, axon guidance. The Global, the, the macro level of those, those little bricks and the little tubes, uh, I, they are definitely real, even the organization in the stria terminalis. And I'm still trying to get my mind uh, around, around that. So I hope that um, uh, there, that I haven't lost you. <laughs> and <laughs> you might think of this uh, more as we, as we continue. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, so I'm not going to jump onto all my questions. I'm just going to ask before if anybody has questions. Are you still thinking about it? Clapping in your hand? That's okay. Probably going to start with my question. Um, if anybody has a question, you can uh, put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, leave the floor to you. Um, so I took some notes as we were going on um, because there was a lot of information that you, you put in there. Um, we have with us like also uh, PhD students and master's students. And... Um, one of the things that I wanted to hear from you is, you know, what is the logic of the new anatomist? Um, from my my little experience and listening to you, it's really exploring through samples that are dyed with different methods to see differently uh, different cells and trying to find like odd organizations or, or patterns that are uh, that are emerging, and then you follow this discovery and try to explain it what, what do you think is that is that like the thought process and the way well, cer certainly it is for me uh and i think you're so a couple of things i would say you're you're touching on the issue of uh, a false dichotomy of hypothesis driven versus 
let's say, descriptive or blue sky. Blue, uh, descriptive has a very bad reputation of, uh, I, and I don't know, to some extent, maybe I'm guilty of that in this presentation. Um, I saw this, isn't this interesting? Uh, at least I took you to the point of, well, so what? Uh, uh, what what is going on? Uh, bad descriptive would be, hey, there's something here, there's something here, there's something here, period. <laughs> um, I'm suggesting, well, there must be a reason for that, uh, although at the moment we're, we're still we're still looking. Hypothesis driven, uh, but good descriptive, and I'll go further, is uh, I always think of, of uh, active archaeology or someone like uh, like Gould with the Burgess Shale. So you see something, it's difficult to, um, what your main data are simply what's there. And it's your task to, uh, using that as a clue to, to state the mystery and to start unraveling it. Now, when I use mystery, let's think of Sherlock Holmes. So he had a clue, but he also knew what he was looking for. He was looking for who did the murder. Um, it's not, we, we don't have a, a body here. I mean, we do, we have a brain. And the question would be, how does it work? But we probably need other questions. And I think the in neuroanatomy, it's you you have those in mind. I mean, I touched on it ex, and 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 really, I know I, I it, it was a light touch, but axon guidance, um, my box of spaghetti, would you think of it as as very as strict parallel? Uh, well, it's not. Well, why would you think? And then so you start with a clue and start pursuing that. What is the contradiction? What is the um, pattern? What is well, how does it relate to uh, to uh, how neurons come together? What I left out completely here would be the the source of of those neurons. Um, I hinted a lot of what I said. I agree was hinting. So in the those little bricks um, are those the parent neurons grouped together in the thalamus, and we don't know. Could we find that out? Yes. With difficulty, you can make micro injections, two or three micro injections in a, one a little brick and see what happens. And you would not want to do that. Far too labor intensive and wrong uh, exploratory. But okay, I don't know if that addresses, I'm sure it doesn't answer. No, it was a, there was a general question about the thought process through the exploration. Of... And I agree, it sounded very, but some people are, are quite adamant that you must have hypothesis driven work. Uh, I, I don't, if you have a good hypothesis, yes, but um, okay, let me share just this with you. Uh, in the, uh, the witch days, witch hunt days of hypothesis-driven research, uh, neuroanatomy really took a, took a hit. And I had a colleague working with, a younger colleague working with John Koss. And she said, well, look, I can make a hypothesis about a teapot. My hypothesis is the teapot exists to make tea. And she was right. I mean, there are uh, bad uh... hypotheses, you know? <laughs> I see what you mean. When you um, when you speak about spaghetti, there is different ways this metaphor has been used, and I just wanted to clarify when you say like white matter is not a um um a box of spaghetti. That's what you said. Yeah. Um, is that so? What you're trying to say is that like because because like if you cook spaghetti, it's, it's a total mess. So it's like they all intertwine together. But when they're in the box, they pack together and they're all going in the same direction. So when you say it's not a box of spaghetti, is that because your experience following ag single axons shows that there is some some crazy trajectory going on? Um, or are you you're trying to say there is an organization, it's way more complex than we think. Um do you see yeah. what I mean? Because yeah, I, I should, can be taken the two way. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so two things. Um, one, uh, 
with my collaborator, Alvaro Duque, um, I'm getting a little bit into developmental sequences in the uh, monkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, he was looking at um, fibers from motor cortex in a very, well, not very early, but like early postnatal and so on. Early stages, it looks fa fairly orderly, uh, approaching a box of spaghetti. It's, it's quite beautiful. But in the adult, uh, uh, much less so. Now, this is again qualitative that I'm I'm uh, sharing with you, <clears throat> and it's mainly his work in progress. Uh, but to the uh, for me, it was quite striking. Early stages, beautifully um, uh, parallel to some extent, more so. So that says as uh, as. Yeah, I guess you would get glia. What happens in the adult? You have glia, you have uh, blood vessels, probably the brain moves uh, with each heartbeat, I guess. Uh, forget uh, sleep and wake and wakefulness. Uh, and in that movement, the 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 uh, probably that's an aspect. The uh, the fibers are not fixed in place. They're not nailed down. Uh, they move a little bit. We know that from spines, all the calcium imaging of spines. Uh, they, they, they twitch, twitching, twitching dendritic spines. So if the spines move, um, surely the, the neurons, uh, the axons would weave a little bit. And with repeated, um, I don't, I don't know how it would, would work. This probably could be uh, with micro prisms. One could visualize, uh, uh, hope to visualize the deep white matter. Because I've seen, um, I've seen people doing trichography using this kind of uh, uh, representation to show that if the streamline is going in tragi tra crazy trajectory, that's because axon do. But because inherently diffusion weight imaging is such a higher resolution than single axon all the only thing that we can catch is the overall trend of this group of axon yes. that look like an organized bundle um but single axon are not but we will never be able to track single axon with yes weight and imaging yeah. and that's where the difference probably is mm, well i don't really want to do this, but I'm going to skip to, this is something I need to come back to. Okay, we're back to tyrosine hydroxylase because it's such a robust uh, label. Uh, this is an adult animal. Mm -hmm. And I think we're looking at uh, an aspect of the cortical uh, pontine track. Uh, mm -hmm. High up, of course, you see where we are. And I don't know, Mish. <laughs> it looks a little tangled to me. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> tangled. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, I need to I need to do much, much more with uh I I'm gonna come back to the in terms of reading and also a little bit of work. Um I don't know what happens. I mean, this is it's organized here, and then something happens. Here is it you know the uh I'm gonna punt on a punt on it, but you can get stuff like this. <laughs> and I agree, you're not going to see single axons. Um, but um I suppose what I'm saying in terms of, of a specific work to do is uh, maybe uh focus at the macro level. And that's one reason I'm I'm a little bit fascinated with these postmortem um, higher resolution stains. If you look at them as bundles, not the single axon, uh, maybe one can ask a question of what uh, are, are there environments? Are there certain environments uh, around the gray matter and white matter, the base of the gyri, where uh, uh, Tangles can happen. Are there some more orderly regions of the white matter, less orderly regions? Uh, I think that type of question still could be asked and can be addressed perhaps with this method and, and might be uh, useful in terms of uh, the bridge to, to imaging. 
P, what do you think of PLI? I mean, that's now being promoted as a bridge from uh, across the scales. It's it, well, PLI is great, but I mean, unless you start like changing the orientation of your sample, you see things in two dimensions, and that's uh, that's yeah. to, that's a bias in the way you can represent the three D structure of the brain, but that can that can solve some precise anatomical questions. Um, so the other issue is you always have the brain in a finite like section. Yeah. You're only going to have coronal, only going to yeah. have sagittal, and, and they usually do coronal. I'm more interested in sagittal section. I never see it. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, it's it's a great method. It's really showing beautiful images and a lot to study in anatomy. Uh, the scale and white matter anatomy are the scales that we've never been able to see before. It doesn't show unmyelinated fibers, that is true. Um, it seems to show quite a smooth organization. Um, but again, you had a higher resolution. So maybe if you if you were putting like some blurry glasses <laughs> looking at those <laughs> very high <laughs> resolution sample, it will look smooth. Uh, and that, uh, but it's good to keep in mind that behind this blurry smoothness, uh, there is there is actually a structure that is more complex than that. Um, you mentioned before also that you following like single axons, you see them like getting together and then going far apart, and there is no real explanation why is it gonna get closer that was like around the beginning you know, yeah I, i'm just just going to that so i was wondering because like uh um time timing of communication between brain areas is critical in the brain things have to arrive pretty much at some moment in the right place otherwise yes you know, the time resolution is scrambled and the overall message or representation of thoughts that we can have doesn't make sense anymore. So I was wondering, maybe they get together because one special constraint that they can have, and I don't know if that's is a presence of oligodendrocytes that will myelinate uh, different axons and eventually, which yes. not been showed, yes. will be responsible for this synchrony. Yes, uh, I think it's a, uh, allow me to say it's an excellent point. And uh, I, I know what you're saying. I don't know the the literature. I think there there are some data on one oligo myelinates how many axons and one uh, axon, how many. Uh, I think it's up to fifty axons. Yeah, and do they form? Uh, of course, then that's only for one segment. So what happens yeah. in the next segment? The next segment. Uh, but I think it's 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 an it's an excellent uh, thing to think about. And could be uh, addressed uh, e even in the in uh, in rodent and three uh, D and, and then uh, extrapolated. Okay. Uh, the timing, uh, I I certainly agree. I'm I'm feeling now. I want to go back, uh, as I said, several points. And forgive me that I haven't already done so. Uh, to probably optic track and uh, where. Uh, it, that's it's a, a more accessible area, uh, and the a question I, I there might be other people now, but Carol Mason did a lot of work on that, and then there was a book I edited in 2016 where she um, has a as a chapter with the references and um, but I and I think there's also a sub uh, I don't know if I. I'm thinking of, but and and I agree with you. It it is this puzzling. We we know the importance of order. We know the importance of timing. Absolutely. So why? How is it that it starts? I'm going to exaggerate and say starts mm -hmm. ordered, ends ordered, but in the middle, it uh, it, it it doesn't care. Uh, that might be too strong a statement, but I just I'll leave us with that. So yeah. And it I is will... very puzzling. It is very puzzling. I, I agree with you. It is really uh it is really bizarre. I, uh, I like you you mentioning the oligos though, uh, whether they form a bundle. And I don't know the, the answer to that, yeah. 
Yeah, there is this paper in science that came out where like um so they started following oligodendrocytes one by one on histological sections. And they saw that like by following those oligodendrocytes, they were able to follow big pathways in the brain. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, that was nice. Um so to come back in on this mystery. So the mystery because you mentioned mystery for two different things and like you tease me with this mystery at the beginning of the presentation and then um then you went maybe, like, maybe. And then I'm, yeah i was not sure i got exactly like like the, the question behind uh, uh the mystery in here okay well the anterior commissure uh is it consists of uh, abundant fibers glutamatergic between mm -hmm. the two hemispheres, uh, mainly linking the uh, temporal and I guess piriform cortex. So, uh, I don't have an internal internalization of the map. So this this white space is chock full of uh, glutamatergic fibers, but and they are presumably going approximately ml, although the commissure is, is somewhat bent. Uh, but then you have these what look like separate, uh, you can call them uh, mini stria, mini fascicles, or sometimes uh, tubes. I thought maybe it was glia tubes, but I haven't been able to find anything to, okay. uh, to follow up. Uh, so number one, why do you have these, these tubes there? I'll call them tubes, although I don't know if that, that's correct. And then... Um, the second thing is, if you look what they are, uh, it's particularly striking in the tyrosine hydroxylase, but just to, uh, to some extent there. Uh, these are clearly, I think, you know, segments of uh, of fibers of tyrosine hydroxylase fibers. Mm. So they're they're not dispersed through the anterior commissure, nor are they bunched in one or two. Uh, nice little fascicles, but they're bunched in these mini fascicles or or tubes. Uh, I emphasized more that they were going uh, uh, obliquely anterior, posterior, probably posterior, uh, perpendicular to the main trajectory, which we don't see here. But mm -hmm. uh, at least as uh, puzzling, and this is what I meant by 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 mystery is why are they grouping together like that? And why at that scale? And uh, then this is just a basically the same thing. I'm not giving you the scale bar, but you yeah, can yeah. extrapolate. Uh, at early stages, they they exist. They, uh, Alvaro has some earlier stages yet. And I didn't have time to go back and, and uh, check what was might be going on. Uh, probably... <laughs> Yeah, it's a good and, question. I think, that in fact, yeah, it's very surprising to. to and see. then it's not just the, uh, in the myelin, it is just at early stage, mm -hmm. anterior commissure versus corpus callosum. But at the, uh, so now we need to go back at the, um, even at two, at two months, you have mm -hmm. the same thing. In the uh, now, I might say, and this goes back <laughs> as a demonstration. Your original question: How does a neuroanatomist think? Uh, I might say, oh, okay, anterior commissure. It's a, and you always see if you go to Google, the first thing it says: It's an ancient structure. It's it's the oldest. Or it's older than the corpus callosum. So okay, something strange going on with uh, um, uh, with with phylogenetically old and then you might say well let's look let's check here let's check here but apparently not because you also see it in the uh, corpus callosum especially anterior though now is it possible that uh i said glia and uh, i don't have any evidence for that except the term in the literature glial glial uh tubes glial uh sling though i just told you it's not what they're talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, is it related to uh, vasculature in, in some way? Uh, so I was going over this with uh, 
my colleague, uh, Jared Rushmore, and he said, oh, look, here's, <laughs> here's some little capillaries. Here's a blood vessel. Here's a blood vessel. I said, well, yeah, but, you know, it's, um, um, I think that would need to be quant uh, quantified uh, a little bit. Uh, See. Right now, I think it, it, your eye catches that it may or may not. And here, blood vessel, blood in in cross section, of course. And could it be like a fibrosal are taking a different direction? Yeah, they. That's what I thought here. Um, you know, like they split and they start like bending in a different direction and cross with yours. I'll be a bit messy, but again, yeah, you showed that mess happened. In the way, yeah. Yeah. apparently, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> now that that's something I think can be. Uh, it will be tedious, but not late. Not really labor intensive. One could go through and uh, uh, again. I'm 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 only half joking. Uh, an atlas of tangles. You know. <laughs> you um. Did you check with polarized light imaging if there was a no, no. Uh, yeah, I could ask. Uh, I don't have the uh, setup here, but I could ask uh, you look to check. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend in Paris. We build his own prototypes of polarized light imaging as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are those are pretty cool. They're like portable, portable polarized light imaging machines. You can put them into your pocket or your yeah. book and, and they work. Like, it's very funny what he's doing. Uh, I have my last question because then I have to prepare food for my kids. Yeah. Um, it sounds good. <laughs> so we, we spoke we spoke a little bit about um neurons that are inside the white matter. I find this like extremely interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you mentioned towards the end. And we we did see with MRI scan, which is a higher resolution, uh a lower resolution, well, you get what I mean, than the, the work that you're doing, some young individuals that have patch of neurons inside that white matter and that's because those neurons during their development didn't reach a cortex oh, okay. do you think we are in the same situation here and those neurons are neurons that never reach a cortex for whatever reason or is this is this like really the optimal making of the brain or what was that plan you it's, think? it's possible that it's it's okay. The, the, what people often say is, yes, they never reach the white matter. Um, let me see. What is it? The over, pro, over proliferation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and it could be a bit of everything there. The, the, I guess the processes are very, are, are multiple and complex. So it can, it can be both. Uh, but I don't, uh, Mish, if, the, if, it, if it is an issue of, of uh, arrested migration, so a problem with migration, mm -hmm. uh, for sure they're not just sitting there in the white matter. They are definitely, definitely uh, a functional. And I don't think it's an accident that the tracers uh, uh, will light up uh, neurons projecting in. And it's also obviously not an accident that the uh, this is the smallest population. The diaphorase is maybe my understanding of something like 5%. And these are inhibitory. Um, but uh, that they are uh, involved, and I'm going to say involved in the, in, the, in the vasculature. Keep in mind that NOS is a, uh, is a dilator, a vasodilator. And these same neurons are often positive for NPY vasoconstrictor. So you have the same neuron. And this would be true of white matter and gray matter. Uh, the same neuron is exerting a vaso as a dilation, dilation and constriction. The dilation, uh, the sphere of influence for dilation is at a, 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 is I think up to a hundred microns. The constriction is probably local. So it's a, it's obviously something complex going, going on. Uh, I guess my puzzle here would be, uh, why don't you have uh, a consistent result? I maybe the the uh, gray matter, maybe to be honest, but at least in this preparation of the uh, midline corpus callosum, not every neuron has is is associated with a blood vessel, and you can sort of see the whole stretches of blood vessel that are empty of a diaphorase companion. Uh, or process. Uh, 
The I had opportunity to talk to Edith Hamill about this several years ago, and uh, she was fascinated with this little lineup, seeming lineup of diaphorase positive neurons at the border of the overlying uh, gray matter and the white matter. She said, oh, well, <laughs> we always talk about gray matter, white matter compartment. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, <laughs> it could be that it, it uh, there's interrelationship, which of course there is. Um, Probably has a soma <laughs> to every one of those axons somewhere in the gray matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I think Stephanie Fockel has a question. Uh, she has a job. Ah, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I am. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, well, thank you very much for this talk. It's uh, really interesting. And after all these informations, I was wondering, um, yeah, what do you think? Uh, where we are in under uh, in understanding the brain uh, between, yeah, monkey and, and human? So how uh, monkey and monkey are. and human then it's easier for me to think in terms of, of the gray matter. Um, and I don't want to uh, dive into specifics, but in terms of the gray matter with neurons, I think we have to be really careful. There's uh, a lot of data coming out uh, from in vitro work. I think Peter Samoji and Mansvelder, uh, among others, of human-specific um, features in the firing properties and and uh, probably things that we only starting to look at with uh, receptors uh, things that we haven't looked at uh, convergence of uh, inputs and uh, the convergence on on a dendritic branch you see partial information uh, but it's going to take uh, I hope there's a, a faster way of doing it um, uh, Mish was mentioning well maybe we need to pull in uh, not to confront AI with neuroanatomy or neuroanatomy with AI, but to pull in AI. And I would I would agree completely. This could be one way of doing it. We also need to uh, have better modeling uh, and way of evaluating the models. Uh, to do this bottom up is is going to be uh, uh, five hundred years is 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 not enough, um, and it'd be rather heartbreaking as, as well. Uh, in terms of the white matter, I almost uh, would like to, to turn the question uh, to you in terms of, because uh, you've thought deeply on the the fornix, the corpus callosum. Um, so may I do that and say, what do you think the, I'm sure overall it's, I think it's similar um, and therefore definitely similar enough for some purposes. Uh, but forgetting that, uh, so the well, the anterior commissure, which I'm paying a little bit more attention to, I think is thinner in human overall than in monkey. I don't know if you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. The proportion of the anterior commissure and the corpus skeleton, like the corpus skeleton in proportion to the anterior commissure, well, the anterior commissure would be much smaller. That's that's what I'm trying to yeah, say. Uh, I, yeah, I, and um, the reason why is um, probably the expansion of frontal, parietal, and temporal in the human brain, and not so much expansion of you know all the olfactory system and uh, this emotional system. Yeah, although, te although temporal lobe yeah, yeah. expands also. Um, I would. I, I know I, I also have colleagues who would love to know more about the hetero organization of heterotopic colossal connections. Mm -hmm. And we know that they exist. Uh, so homotopic is the same if, if you designate one uh, brick of cortex, it will go if there are colossal connections because some re regions are acolossal, it will go to the same. But you also uh, the data from monkey is that um, you have the same set of heterotopic connections as homotopic ipsilateral, except they're not as dense. So then among other questions, uh, focusing on the white matter, how do they branch? Do they branch in the corpus callosum? Do they branch only in the gray matter when they go over to the other hemisphere? So we're back into this issue of, of branch points. Do they all branch? They can't possibly branch at the same point because um, 
uh, V2, and I don't know if this is, if, if even this is known in the monkey, if it, the heterotopic therefore should be to homotopic to V2, heterotopic to V4, MT, and maybe others. So V4, MT, where does it peel off? And, and I know, it, it's a very good question. Um, so we started looking a little bit at that, and it's really difficult because uh, you cannot believe into tractography to show you homotopic or heterotopic connection in a very reliable way. Uh, just because like the fibers, like the bundle merge together, and then it's easy to take a different direction when you merge out on the other hemisphere. Um, but we've been looking at the structure of the midsection of the corpus callosum on sagittal sections. Oh, uh, yeah. and, uh, and one thing that we've seen that was an odd finding is some, some people show some visible anteroposterior fibers in the midsection instead of being, you know, lateral, medial, or from one hemisphere to another. So we have this green band of connections in the corpus callosum. In few people, like 10%, it's visible only in 10% of people. And we started quantifying this and tried to relate it with, um, if I remember, reaction time uh, in a conflictual information. So like typically you show a left arrow and you got to press right, show right arrow and you got to press left. And they significantly correlate with this, like this lower. So we interpreted that as like aberrant fibers, but this is as far as we got there. And now we're pushing the resolution in macaque and in squirrel monkeys, so we get to... Uh, to uh, run. No, squirrel monkey would be a good choice, I think. Uh, I love it. I got, I got 15 in Paris. Love that species. They're lovely. It's it's great working with them. Yeah. And, uh, so we get down in vivo to 400 micron, and post-mortem, we get to 200 micron diffusion weight and imaging, and we started looking at midsection and there might be there might be an organization there but we we're waiting to confirm that with a different setup of acquisition to be sure it's not an artifact but I'll, if it's confirmed i'll send you i'll send you a picture yeah yeah that that's and you you need to inject i mean that you could make a large injection uh, uh any place or just do four animals two in v2 uh -huh. Yeah. Two in uh, somatosensory, and or or two in somatosensory, two in frontal. And, right. Yeah. We'll and then, we'll, we'll need the ethic committee to clear to clear that up. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. right now. Right now, the setup is to study um, uh, the biology of frontal parietal disconnections, and its link with recovery of visuospatial um, uh, performance. So we disconnect track. Mm -hmm. Look at what is going on, basically. Um, uh, uh, let me remind you, in the uh, macaque and probably in squirrel monkey, uh, certain parts of the parietal lobe project to uh, peripheral B1. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I don't know, with going back to some, also concurrently pondering Stephanie's question with macaque and, and, and human. Macaque is a, is is a good model for sure. Uh, it's maybe not as good as we often say. Uh, and I remember as a graduate student, I was, I was cutting a paraffin hemisphere. I started in the morning and I was still five o'clock at night during a visit from uh, Frederick Sinidis. Uh, so I'm going oh, back wow. to the 70s. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. And uh, you, <laughs> he, he said to me- I only read the papers. <laughs> yeah, you know, he said to me, so why are you working in, in macaque monkey? And, and as a young graduate student, I said, well, because it's the closest we, we can uh, model to human. And he laughed. He just laughed at me. He said, uh, yeah, but it's not. Chimpanzee is much closer. <laughs> and right. His oh, words with all those years have, have uh, stayed in, in my in my mind. But the uh, the macaque is is probably as good as we could get. We should not forget the, chimp the chimpanzee. And uh, maybe this is the last thing we say. Uh, let me put in a word for the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins. And I say that because the brain looks so different. And I just appreciated this within the last uh, 
year, layer one, it's almost a, an apical dendrite. It's a pyramidalized brain wow. uh, with no layer four, no layer four, not even the what people argue with, with macaque motor cortex. Uh, no layer four. Uh, there's uh, some nice papers now going back in the literature, but uh, the Italian group has published, I think it's Cosi, or uh, I can send you or we can dialogue, uh, and a thick layer one. So it's it's uh, almost has has aspects of the entorhinal cortex, um, but it doesn't have an open layer four. It doesn't have a lamina desiccans. And so it 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 uh, I looked at that and said, well, we uh, at least every so often we need to be skeptical about what we know of brain organization and work within a framework. Um, you have to have a framework, but at the same time, be uh, every so often willing to uh, to question it. And I mean, I, as our discussion, we're basically bringing up questions, so I, I don't see any problem there. Uh, and and then uh, ultimately, but I think there's some of these contrasts, like the how you could have a brain with we. In other words, there the lesson would be: Are we overemphasizing layer four? as a recipient layer we probably are because the basal dendr the dendrites of passage layer three pours its basal dendrites into layer four and apical dendrites going through so it's um and in a way neuroanatomy you don't want to be the um what canary in the mind uh or always saying no no but i think uh neuroanatomy is in a very good position to say uh yes this is what we think these are the exceptions uh what are the exceptions doing do does it mean we don't know the whole story that's 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 only what i would come back to not that things are wrong things can be wrong if they're overemphasized but otherwise it's simply we don't know the whole story and the whole story is more interesting maybe than we think Thanks. Well, on those beautiful words, I uh, think I got to cook dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it sounds, I'm sure it's going to be very good, Mish. <laughs> I'll, uh, I was happy to see this and I'll, I'll follow up by email with uh, uh, some pictures and exchange. Yeah. Um, I have some diffusion of uh, whales and dolphins. Who oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Look in the end. Well, you some questions. Yeah. <laughs> some Great. questions. Okay, it sounds fantastic. All right, thank you very much for your time and for your presentation. Uh, I deeply enjoyed uh, being there and listening to you. And um, I hope I'll see you soon, maybe in Montreal at OHBM or somewhere else. No, certainly in, uh, in in Corsica in March. I hope before, but I'm not I, so sure. I will be there. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. It was nice Thank you, you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.